Okay. Hi, everybody. How's the cold and wet going for all of us? Yep. Great. Okay. Anything I should know about, be aware of? Good. Because right, I'm not, but, you know, great. All right, we're on to Mendelian Genetics Part 2. It's great. Um, on Friday, we saw this, right? That you can have true breeding plants or any sort of organism. You can cross them. Um, they'll have an F1 generation, right? So far, so good. Um, and then if you use something like this, where you cross these true breeding plants, right? There are a whole bunch of F1 generations that are that that have inf that have genetic information from both mom and dad. Um, when you allow those plants to cross with themselves, right? So you have F1 plants mating with other F1 plants. You have this distinct three to one ratio where you have a lot of purple plants, but still you have some white plants. Everyone's cool with this so far? Great. Okay. So, the next idea concept that comes up, and again, I am super impressed with Mendel, is what's called the law of segregation. Meaning, okay, you know that each, you know that each organism, each individual, has received genetic information or an allele from each parent, right? So, this F1 flower got genetic information from its dad flower, right? So it has this it has this allele for purple flower color that it got from its dad. It got an allele from, for white flower color from its mom. And you know it's there because later um, in the F2 generation, when you're making these purple plants with themselves, white's still there. It comes back. So it was there to begin with. It was just being masked. So far, so good? Great. So you have organisms that have two alleles for a heritable characteristic, and when these when these organisms make a gamete, so either a sperm or an egg, they're only going to put one of those alleles into that sperm or the egg. Um, Mendel didn't, didn't know what this thing was, but we know that's when the homologous chromosomes split up in meiosis. But the take-home message here is, all right, so you've got two alleles for something. Great. They're in you as the organism. When you make a gamete, you're picking one of those two. And it's a flip of a coin, which one you pick? It's both are equally likely. Because of this, because you know both are equally likely, there's a tool you can use to set up, to, to figure stuff out. It's called a Punnett square. And in that whole, like, the equator is a line drawn on the Earth concept, planet squares don't, like, exist in nature. You can't, like, sneakily go and find one, right? It's just a tool used to keep your thinking straight as you, um, as you work stuff out, all right? So what a planet square is doing is it's just showing you, all right, these are the options for... Um, mom egg to be, these are the options for dad sperm to be. If those options combine, what are the possible options for offspring? Are we okay with this concept? We're going to draw, well, I'll put, we're doing it here on the computer because of online folks. Okay, so if we have this thing happening here, right? Dad's, this is the same experiment we've seen several times now. Side note, are we all okay that it's not really about pea plants? Right, we're doing this pea plants, but it's not because you need to care all that much about pea plants. Right, it's a model for how genetics works and other things. Okay with this? It's kind of like, I remember doing um, an algebra, I don't know if you ever did this, an algebra where you like measure the shadow of the tree and then you figure out how tall the tree is. I remember thinking as I was doing this is, with however old you are when you do these, being like, I think this textbook author misunderstands how often I want to measure trees, right? It's not really about the trees. Okay, 
It's not really about the peas, but the principles hold. Okay, back to our work. We've got our nice true breeding purple flower plant. When it picks an allele to give, to give into its sperm, right? It's only going to put one allele in. It could either pick this big P allele, or equally likely, it could pick that big P allele, right? Both are equally likely. Both are that big P allele. So far, so good. Same deal goes for this white, this white flower plant. It could pick either this little P allele or this little P allele. Both are equally likely. And so you're going to end up with one of these and one of these. They're going to come together and all of their children are going to have the same combination of alleles. They're going to have this dominant one they got from dad and this, re I just decided this one's dad, not with mom, just because. Um, and this recessive one they got from mom. We're cool? Great. Now, when this flower goes around making a gamete, it could, it's going to pick an allele to put in, right? It can either pick this one or this one. They're both equally likely, right? But it can't put both of them in. And it can't put the average of them in. It has to pick one or the other. Fair enough? So a plant square is this thing it's used just to keep your options straight. Because otherwise, you start, it's easy to get mixed up. Right? So, I realize it's cold out, but we're going to do this with ice cream for just a moment. If you're there, okay, does anybody, if you go to like someplace that has a whole bunch of ice cream, you show up and they're like, oh, I feel overwhelmed. A little bit? Okay. Anyways, my dad gets vanilla ice cream, even if you're at like a fancy ice cream shop, which I think is just lame because like seriously, you could, you could have vanilla at home. But anyways, he says he likes vanilla, so. But okay, if you have say two choices for ice cream, no cone, you could have something like chocolate and vanilla on top. You're getting two scoops in this cone. You could have chocolate and chocolate. You could have vanilla and vanilla. We have chocolate, vanilla, or vanilla and chocolate. Do you see all these options? Okay. A plant square is trying to keep your headspace right for this. It's saying, okay, cool. This is dad. If dad is this F1 generation, the, this, 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 this plant that has uh, one dominant, one recessive allele, it could give this one. So we're going to throw out this as one option up here. It could also, equally likely, give this option. Boom, we're going to draw it up here. Mom is just like this too. So when mom has an egg, it could either have this one or it can have that one. Fair enough. Then the possible combinations of this are, all right, we could either have dad give this and mom give that and we're here. We could have... Dad gives little P, mom gives big P, we're here. We could have dad give this, mom give this, we're here. Or we could have dad, mom, we're here. Everyone's cool with these options? These two options, um, when you're writing these out, oh, well, some terms I'll come back to this. When an organism has two identical alleles, it's called homozygous. So that would be that purple plant up there in the P generation. Two alleles that are big P, two dominant alleles, it's homozygous for that. That white flower up there is also homozygous, but it's homozygous for the recessive characteristic. Everyone's okay with this? Homo meaning the same, right? So it's 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 got two copies of the same allele. Heterozygotes are going to be organisms that have different versions 
of alleles, so two different alleles for the same gene, right? So um, this individual is heterozygous. This one too, actually up here, this is heterozygous as well. Can you see that? So um, with like plants, if it's something true breeding, it's going to be homozygous, right? Those ones up there, they're true breeding. If they mate with themselves, they always have the same looking offspring. Heterozygous organisms are not true breeding. And you don't usually talk about true breeding with, with organisms like people, because people seldom, if ever, mate with themselves and have little offsprings, right? We're okay with this. Um, so homozygous and heterozygous just says, do you have two copies that are the same, or do you have two copies that are different? Fair enough? Great. Um, other terms. I should turn the page on my slides here. Um, going back up to something like this. <coughs> this organism right here is purple, right? Cool. It's purple. This organism down here is also purple, right? But they happen to have different genetics. Do you see that? So it can get kind of tricky to describe things in biology. You can be like, okay, so I'm talking about the pea plants that are purple, and they always have purple offspring, so they're true breeding, they're homozygous for this, um, as opposed to those other plants that they're purple, but they're heterozygous for this, and blah, 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 blah. Right? If you're describing the physical characteristics of something, something you can see, the physical characteristics, that's one kind of thing you're worried about, right? I want to know how many purple plants there are. I want to know the physical characteristics. That is called a phenotype. If you're looking at the genetics, you want to know what the genes look like. Those are called genotypes. We're okay with this? There's a phenotype showing physical characteristics. Genotype describes the genes making it up. So something like this. In that cross we saw before, there are two phenotypes, purple flowers or white flowers, but there are three genotypes, because you can have a genotype that's homozygous dominant, homozygous recessive, or the heterozygotes. Is everyone okay with this? Um, just, just to be honest, because I feel like I should be honest. I mean, I try to be honest in general, but um, in things like pea plants, these phenotypes are something you, you can see, right? You're like, it's tall, it's short, it's purple, it's white, right? In biology as a whole, when you talk about phenotypes, like let's say you're looking at um, mice, a phenotype can be something that's observable when you're not looking at the genetics. So maybe you have some mice that are like super chill and some mice that like go for your throat, right? So the really, really aggressive mice, that could be a phenotype. Are we okay with that? It's something you can observe, right? You can have a phenotype of a really, really fast metabolism. Is everyone okay with this as a concept? Um, one of my buddies in grad school totally spent her, did her research on these super aggressive mice. Like, like I've done work with mice before, and they're mean little buddies. I'd like to point out, they bite you, and you're like, yeah, I mean, that's fair, because I watch, like, run mazes and stuff, but, like, they bite you. But she had these, like, extra special aggressive mice. I'm like, well, tough luck for you. She's like, no, but we learned a lot about, like, social bonding and blah, 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 anyway. Um... Yeah. Okay, we're okay with phenotypes versus genotypes. In some situations, for instance, if you know the phenotype here of this white one, do you know its genotype? No. Yeah, how come? You're right, but how come? Because it, there's only one outcome. You can't tell. Yeah, are we okay with that? So if you know that this one's white, 
because it's the recessive character, or sorry, the recessive trait here, the only way for that one to show up is if the phenotype is the homozygous recessive, right? However, and this leads us into the next concept, if you know the phenotype up here is purple, you don't actually know if that gene type is homozygous or heterozygous, right? Because you don't have enough information yet. But maybe you want to find out because you're this kind of dedicated biologist who's like, huh, I want to know. So what you're going to do is you're going to do something called a test cross. So we're right here. You have mystery pea plant. So I'm very excited with the stick. I don't know why. I'm in a weird mood, but okay. Excited to stick. You have mystery pea plant. You know that purple pea plant either has to be big P, big P, or big P, little P. Everyone solves with this? Dominant, dominant, or dominant recessive. Cool? You know for a fact that the recessive phenotype one is homozygous recessive. Great. So, we're going to actually do this on the board. If I'm not sure if that helps. Sorry, I'm lying, people. I do not know how viewable the chalkboard is. Okay. Which one do we want to do first? Do we, we want to figure out what this mystery pea plant is. Do we think mystery pea plant is homozygous dominant or heterozygous? There's no information here, just guess. We want to check with heterozygous. Okay. If this plant is heterozygous, when that plant crosses with the white plant, there are a couple things that can happen. Okay. So, the, I'm going to do just one on the left is dad, one on the right is mom, just because it makes sense to me. We're going to look at mom first. The mom plant, that white plant, when it picks an allele to give, what options can it give? Just one, right? It has to be the little p. If we want to draw it out twice, we could. It could either give the first little p or the second little p. Honestly, if you're ever doing these problems on your own, just draw it out once because you're like, yeah, they're the same. Okay? It could either give that one or that one, which is the same thing. So it could either give little p or little p. Cool. Um, dad. If we think his dad is heterozygous, if he's big p, little p. What options for alleles could he give? Two, right? He could either give the dominant one, or he could give the recessive one. Cool. When the options from dad and options from mom, right? So half time he'd give a big P, and mom would give a little P. All right? Half the time, dad gives a little P, and mom also gives a little P. That's not a 3 to 1 ratio, right? Before we saw a 3 to 1 ratio, but that was with two heterozygous crosses. With this one, with a heterozygous and a homozygous, you get, well, let's see what you get. What color is this piece? Purple. 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 Yeah, you expect half and half, half purple, half white. We're okay with this? If, if dad's heterozygous for that. Cool. What if dad's Home is, I guess, dominant. What do we see then? Mom, gonna stay the same. What are the options for dad? He's home is, I guess, dominant. One, right? You can either give that big P or the other big P, right? And you could just drop that once. So then when you have the options, you either get a big P from dad and a little P from mom, or a big P, P from dad and a little P from mom. Or a big P from dad and a little P from mom. Or a big P from dad and a little P from mom. They're all going to be purple. Fair enough? Everyone's cool with this? So, um, if you... Uh, so, 
we're here, right? If you do a test cross, if you do a test cross and you see that you end up with some of the recessive trait that shows up, you know, oh, it must have been heterozygous. If you see none of the recessive traits show up and all of the dominant traits show up, you think, huh, it's going to be um, homozygous dominant. Are we okay with this as a concept? Sneaky, sneaky question. Um, let's say the purple pea plant and the white pea plant just have one offspring. All right. And again, we're back to not knowing whether this one's um, homozygous or heterozygous. If they just have one offspring and it's white, just one, do you know the genotype up here? Yeah, how come? Yes, you're right. I'm going to repeat just because you see. Only, only, the only way to get a white is if you get a recessive from both parents. To have, to have a recessive phenotype, you have to get recessive from both parents. So you know it's there. Okay. If you still don't know, so you got to have you still don't know if it's um, homozygous or heterozygous, this, this purple one here, and you have, and you cross those, and you have one offspring and it's purple. Do you know if it's homozygous or heterozygous, this one here? You can't, right? Is that okay with this? If you have one and it's white, if, if these two have one and it's white, you know, like, oh yeah, it's got to be heterozygous. If you have one and it's purple, you still don't know that. Is that a fine fast concept? I mean, if you have a basquillion and they're all purple, you're like, yeah, okay, there's no, there's no white here. Um, questions? Sorry, basquillion is not an official term. Okay. Sorry, people are looking at me like, what? Okay, so this is nice, right? It's beautiful. Are you a little bit bored by it yet? Not yet? Oh, but wait, it gets better. Um, Mensa's looking at things one at a time. He's looking at, um, he was looking at, originally he was looking at single characteristics, right? How tall is this pea plant? What, the co what color are the pea peas themselves? What color are the flowers? What color are... The pea pods, how, what shape are the pea pods, right? But pea plants have more than one thing happening at the same time, right? You can have a tall pea plant with purple flowers, uh, green seeds, and wrinkled, right? When you're looking at something like this, it's called a monohybrid. It's just, you're looking at one characteristic. Um, he wanted to look at what happens when you look at two characteristics at the same time. These are called dihybrid crosses because there's two of them. So here we're on to this idea. So same rules as before, but now we have more stuff happening. He's got pea plants that are true breeding for yellow round seeds. Peas, right? But because I'm already using pea plants as peas, I, okay. Um, oh, sorry, I should have mentioned this. Are we okay that um, capital letters represent the dominant allele? Capital letters are going to represent dominant. Lowercase letters are going to represent recessive. And just for convention, you're going to draw, you're going to write the dominant one first and the recessive one next. Is that okay with this? Just for purposes? Okay. Cool. So Mendel has these pea plants. He's got a whole bunch of pea plants that are true breeding for yellow and round. And since they're true breeding for yellow, he knows both of the alleles are dominant. All right, so they're true. Sorry, he doesn't know that yet. He just knows they're both the same. He knows true breeding for yellow, they're both the same. True breeding for round, they're both the same. This thing's homo double homozygous. All right? He's got other pea plants that true breed green and true breed wrinkly. Okay? And so if you cross these with themselves, they're always green wrinkly, always green wrinkly, green wrinkly. Far so good? It's like Yoda. Okay. We're cool. Great. If he crosses these true breeding round yellow ones with these true breeding green wrinkly ones, he always gets 
yellow round ones. Right? So now we know, okay, okay, if these two cross, this one's yellow round, we know, we know yellow's dominant, right, because, because it shows up here, and we know round is dominant because it shows up here. Have I lost anybody yet? Is it okay? Okay. Um, with that, this, this organism here has this genotype, right? Big Y, little Y, big R, little R. Dominant for yellow, recessive for yellow, so it's heterozygous. Dominant for round, recessive for round, heterozygous there as well. We're cool? And if we go back a step and we're looking at the gametes that got produced by these pea plants, we know this pea plant must have given one of these and one of these. It either gives this one and this one, or this one and this one, or this one and this one, or this one and this one. We have a combination. It gave one of each of the dominants, right? And this one gave one of each of the recessives. So big Y and big R came together. They showed up together, and they showed up in this plant together. These two show up together in gametes, and they're both in this plant. What Mendel wants to know, he's like, great. Those two alleles traveled together when, when they became this plant. Do they travel together when this plant has an offspring? And that's a decent question, right? You see this? Like, are they stuck? Do they, are they buddies? So, two hypotheses, depending on which which one's true? So there's the there's the hypothesis of dependent assortment and the hypothesis of independent assortment. So in the hypothesis of dependent assortment, what that means is, all right, if, let me go back a step, if these things travel together, right, they travel together the first time because they had to, this time, if they travel together, this one when it's giving off, when it's giving these alleles, it's going to give these together and those together, right? That's the dependent one. One is dependent on the other. So if that's the case, if that's the case, um, both, sorry, both mom and dad right now are right here, okay? Um, if it's dependent, you expect, okay, um, dad could either give dominant dominant or recessive recessive. Mom could either give dominant dominant or recessive recessive. Right? And then you'd have either double homozygous dominant, this one, or this one, or this double homozygous recessive. It's pretty straightforward. This looks really similar to what we saw before. Right? That if that those if those alleles have to move together. Right. The other hypothesis is the hypothesis of independent assortment. It's saying, yeah, the dominant ones in this and the last generation, yeah, they travel together. They don't have to travel together. So if I've got um, this organism that's heterozygous, it could, in independent assortment, it could either give this or this. It could either give this or this, and they're all equally likely. Fair enough? So what that means is you have a lot more options. So in the first example, in the dependent example, you have two options for the type of sperm or egg you can give, right? In independent assortment, you now have four options. Because the sperm here could either have, could either, it's, it's a flip of a coin for, for each allele, right? It could either give the big Y or the little Y. And it could either give the big R or the little R. So you end up with four options, right? You could have dominant, 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 recessive, recessive, dominant, recessive, recessive, right? And mom could have the same. So then when those combinations combine, you have a whole ton of options. And you have some options you have never seen before, right? 
back up here, you had green wrinkly peas and yellow round peas. Those are your choices. If these alleles separate independent of each other, you can end up with things like this, like a green round pea that you never had before. We're cool with this? Or this yellow wrinkly pea. We've never seen a yellow wrinkly pea before. Okay, this? Based on the amount of time I've been yapping about this one, any guesses which one actually is how it works? Yeah, it's, <coughs> it's independent assortment. So when our buddy Mendel does this, he makes this cross, he counts out 315 yellow round peas, 108 green round peas, 101 yellow wrinkly peas, and 32 wrinkly green peas, which is a ratio of about 9331, which is exactly what you'd predict with something like this. All right, you've got nine ways to make, to make the round one, the yellow, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. You have three ways to make these round green ones. You have three ways to make these round yellow, sorry, these wrinkly yellow ones, and only one way to make this thing. Yeah? It's, people doing okay? It's worth mentioning that, um, just because there are a lot more yellow peas than there are green peas, does that mean there are a lot more dominant alleles than there are recessive alleles? No, there aren't, right? It's just dominant, dominant, and dominant recessive both show up as yellow, right? Whereas the only way to see green is if, they're, if you got the recessive from both mom and dad. Is that okay? But everything's still equally likely here with this kind of cross. We're good? Hoo -hoo. All right. There is a huge caveat. So this is super important, and you should like commit this to memory that, yes, these things assort independently of each other with a caveat. Um, love independent assortment. Alleles segregate independently of each other. Mendel got kind of lucky. So he's right, but he also got kind of lucky in that um, the, the gene for P color and the gene for P wrinkliness aren't close together on the same chromosome. So if genes are if genes are like right smack dab next to each other on the same chromosome, they're often inherited together. Are we okay with this? But if genes are in different chromosomes, completely, completely um, independent assortment. Fair enough? Is that a fair caveat? Great. It's, um, if we're going for <coughs> dumb analogies, if if you're showing up, and this is not a great analogy, but like work with me here, if if everybody is showing up with um, oh two cookies, right? That they're gonna give one. So I have a chocolate chip cookie and a peanut butter cookie, and you have two peanut butter cookies, right? You're gonna give one peanut butter cookie, and I'm gonna give either the chocolate chip cookie or the peanut butter cookie. I can give them independent of each other. Cool, right? Um. If things are on the actual same chromosome, they're coming together. The chocolate chips are physically in the chocolate chip cookie. I'm not going to tear this cookie apart and only give you the chocolate chips. Uh -huh. Okay. All's well with that. Great. But, 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 assuming, assuming the genes for these alleles, right, so color or wrinkliness, are in different chromosomes, or even far enough apart on the same chromosome because crossing over, Completely independent. And you can end up with things that you never saw before. And it's not like this green one of some random mutation, right? It's not that. The genetics for it were there, but they hadn't been combined in that option. And now they're combined in the option and it shows up. Yay. Right? Everyone's cool with this? And you, 
you know this just based on seeing things before, right? So like, um, oh, you see somebody who has blue eyes and um, light hair and they have a child with someone who has dark hair and dark eyes and their kid now has dark eyes but light hair. And you're like, oh, hey, I see that. that. And you also can see something that looks just like one of the other parents, right? You also can see this combo. Yeah? Cool. Okay. <coughs> um, before we go on, we need to talk about probability slightly. So I have brought this dice. It's from a game we have. It's all about like patting your head and like touching your toes. It's very exciting. We, my mother lent us a game a while ago about ducks and these ducks quack. We gave it back because it's wonderful, but oh my goodness, they just like quack, quack, quack. Ah, too much quack. Okay, but this one is nice. It's very quiet. Um, you roll the dice and then you do things. It's great. Before class, I rolled this dice a couple of times. And it showed up purple twice. Which means, right, that because this dice is mostly fair, I think it's pretty fair, because this dice is mostly fair, it means when I roll it again, it absolutely cannot be purple. Right? There's no way it could be purple because it's already been purple, it's a fair dice, it has to be something else. Right? Yes? People making hmm sounds. Why making hmm sounds at me? I think it's a fair dice. If it was just barely purple, it has to be something else. No? No. Dax, you're shaking your head like I'm misunderstanding dice. Help me out. You're saying he doesn't remember what it was? No. Okay. He's right, right? Are we okay with this? Everyone's solving this? Okay, okay, so it's not, but it's, okay, with dice it's easy to see. It's be like, yeah, okay, just because I God, or it doesn't mean that, like, the universe doesn't remember, right? Same thing with, with dice being flipped. Uh, sorry, not dice being flipped. Uh, coins being flipped. If you flip a head, it's not like the coin's like, oh, I just flipped a head. It better be a tail next time, right? It doesn't know this, right? So it is weird, like, assuming this dice is fair. I actually don't think it is entirely fair, but assuming this dice is fair, we all know what fair means, like, it's equally likely, right? Okay. If something gets fair, it would be we weary from the beginning to be like, it's going to be red three times in a row. Right? But if it's already been red twice, being red on the next roll is just as likely as being any other color. Okay. You know this with dice. You know this with coins. It's sometimes tricky to remember with biology. And you'll see this when people have kids. Um, oh. Uh, my sister-in-law just had her third... Their, their third child, and they had two boys, and now they had a third boy, and there was some discussion in the family, like, oh, they've only had two boys, this one must be a girl. Yeah, the universe does not remember, right? So, back before they had any kids, to guess, oh, I bet they have three boys, that's a little bit odd, to have three in a row, but after you already have two, right, if you flipped heads or tails, whichever one, you flipped tails twice in a row, this next time you're flipping a coin, it doesn't remember what was flipped before. So, the likelihood for the third boy to be a boy was, again, a flip of a coin. Is everyone okay with this as a concept? Okay. All that... You also are a fast class, because you're like, yeah, no. Go you. Um, Mendelian genetics are going to be based off of probabilities. Okay? So, with something... Maybe based off of probabilities, and let's find a good place to get, to get here. Um, it's not always that three to one ratio it has to do. The three to one ratio is what you see, what you expect to see if you've got um, a monohybrid cross. If you've got like big P, little P, big P, little P crossing, the math works out that way. But if you have something like this, right, you're gonna expect half and half for phenotypes. Um, and you're, because you're expecting each of these to be equally likely for both sperm and egg. Um, and so that would make like half and half here, right? Or 
if you're looking at something like this, da, 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 these ones, it's a dihybrid cross, right? Each of the, those four eggs are equally likely, each of those four sperm are equally likely. And then you end up with this whole bunch of combinations, all equally likely. They're all, so each of these are equally likely, but then because of the ways these combine, this one's way more common, right? There are nine out of 16 ways to get this thing, where there's only one out of 16 ways to get this thing, right? This one's way more likely than this one. But if those two pea plants have just one kid, it's totally possible that they end up with this one, even though this one's way more likely. Right? Sound as fine as this? Okay. So now we get to move into the math portion of today. 10 minutes? We've got this in 10 minutes. We're not going to cover all the math portion of today. Um, it's actually really kind of straightforward math. It's beautiful. Anybody taken statistics yet? Oh, okay. If you take statistics, you'll see stuff like this, but a lot more so. I realize I'm beating this idea to death, but it helps to make things make sense. We're going to pretend we're, we're back just to, to a mono hybrid thing. We're going to pretend that we're crossing something that's Dominant recessive, so heterozygous for R, whatever R is, I don't know, R can be whatever. Um, with another heterozygous for dominant recessive, right, big R, little R. And we're saying, alright, when this one over here separates into alleles for eggs, it can either give big R or the little R. Right? It can either get big R or the little R, both are equally likely. Um, we're going to flip a coin to the side, if we flip heads, we're giving big R, if we flip tails, we're giving little R. Alright? And then, you end up with this, with this situation, right? Because the same thing happens here. Um, there's one out of the four possibilities, one way to get two heads. Out of the four possibilities, one way to get two tails. And two possibilities to get one heads, one tails. Yeah? Great. What? Um, oh my goodness. Do, 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 sorry. We're going to look at something called the addition rule first, and then we're going to look at, on Wednesday, we'll look at the multiplic multiplicative rule. Um, the addition rule is just saying, all right, you know the probabilities of each of these events. If you want to know the probability of it, any of those two exclusive events, exclusive means they can't have it at the same time, you just add together the probabilities. Stay with me here. Um, so if you want to know the probability of, say, um, in this scenario, you want to know the probability of these two having a child. Are we okay that these are each children? Okay. You want to know them of having a child that has at least one recessive allele? How do we do that? Um, at least one recessive allele? Yes, no. No? Yes? Yes? Yes. Are we okay that the probability is 3 out of 4? And we did that just by adding together the probability straight up. So that's 3 out of 4. You can do this in decimals as well. So if each of these is 0.25, right, as a order. You could have 0.75, you just add them together, right? Or what about the probability of, um, let's say, the probability of them being homozygous for something? We don't care what it's homozygous for, but homozygous for something. What's the probability of that? Uh, 2 out of 4, right? So you've got one way, two ways out of four possible. Is that okay with that? 2 out of 4, that's... that's 1 out of 2, that's 0.5. Solve on this. Yeah? Okay, people are nodding like this is obvious. It's not entirely obvious. I mean, maybe it is. Okay, it is to most of this class. So when you have exclusive events, and you want to know the probability of them, you just add them up. So, I recognize they're not numbers here. But if I want to know the probability, well, we'll do this with colors. Um, Six sides on this dice, yeah? I want to know the probability of rolling orange. One out of six, right? If 
you want to know the probability of rolling orange or red? What's that? Two out of six. Orange, red, and green? Three out of six. Right? All the way up to any of the colors, it's six out of six. I have to roll some color. Fair enough? Questions? Oh, it gets good. Because you then can get complicated things happen. So we're not going to go into this yet, but just to think about it in five minutes, just to think about it, to be emotionally prepared. For really dinky crosses like that, cool, whatever. There are a lot of options for some complicated things, right? So we're going to need a little bit more math to be like, oh, okay, if I have, um, what's the probability of having green wrinkled with white flowers or something funky like that? We're going to have to do a little bit more to get there. But it's going to be good. Concerns? Questions? Everyone is super 100% solved on the idea that um, alleles that are not on the same chromosome are going to separate independent of each other. The, the, the allele doesn't remember what the mother looked like. Right? Sweet. That's all we have. Um, yeah, I will see you on Wednesday then. Try not to freeze to death.